الذين آمنوا وتتمن قلوبهم بذكر الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رحمتك ورحمة الرحمن إن شاء الله we begin in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى we send our blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and we also thank the Sahaba رضي الله تعالى وجمعين والله ما بفز if it wasn't for the Sahaba me and you wouldn't have enjoyed the religion the way we do and so we ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى that allow me and you to follow the Sunnah of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and also as we are not complete in any way or form and we can never get to the status of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم we ask Allah to allow us to actually get a characteristic of a Sahabi so we could be like one and uh, as the Sahabas were special people they were guided and they were the ones that Allah has forgiven for their past sins and whatever they did in future so inshallah we are on the battle of Uhud there's a lot to cover it feels like it's not going to be finished today as well so I'm not going to give you false hope that it will be over today uh, inshallah we have an aim my aim is to get to the martyrdom of uh, Hamza and uh, also speak about the initial skirmish as well how Muslims were winning so in the last lecture you remember we spoke about um, um, the archers how Muhammad sallallahu actually spoke to the archers and he said that do not come down and uh, we also uh, spoke about um, a rahib Amir al Rahib, he was the man who was one of the other leaders like Abdullah ibn Ubayya Sulul and he wanted to also become the leader. So Amir al Rahib comes to Abu Sufyan and he says to him, Let me talk to the Ansar and they will leave Muhammad وسلم, and in that way we can actually take over these people. And then subhanAllah, they, when he screamed, the Sahaba, the Ansaris, they turn around and said, You're not Amir al Rahib, you're Amir al Fasiq. And we are not going to be listening to you. And they shunned their own leader and he actually was humiliated and he left the battlefield from there. Also, uh, now uh, the battlefield is now really warm. Now this is the point where Muhammad وسلم, now wants to see how committed these people are. And he says to, uh, out loud, من يأخذ هذا سيف بحقه that who is going to take my sword and give it the due right? So I know it's a Friday night, you want to go home, there's better things to do rather than watching a scary, a scary face like me and to listen to me. But so, um, you know, generally uh, a face like me you see in Daily Telegraph on the first page, uh, not for the right reasons. So anyways, inshallah, you know, the, the bit of humor is important. So. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ يَأْخُذْ هَذَا سَيْفَ بِحَقِّهِ Who's actually going to take my sword and give it the right. Now subhanAllah at this point Ali radiallahu an comes forward and he says give it to me, Rasulullah does not give it to him. Hamza comes forward, Asadullah, and Rasulullah does not give it to him as well. And Miqdad, he comes forward. And Miqdad ibn Aswad is, uh, uh, is actually a very strong Sahabi as well, another warrior. This is the one who said to Rasulullah wasallam in the battle of Badr, did Allah tell you this place? And so he also comes forward and Rasulullah did, uh, does not give him the sword. And then comes Zubair ibn Awam, another warrior. And Rasulullah does not give him the sword. Now all these are greatest fighters. Rasulullah is not uh, giving the sword. Now uh, there is a man by the name of Abu Dujana. He's Ansari. He understood. You know, Rasulullah has asked a question. So he says, وَمَا حَقِّهُ وَمَا حَقُّهُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ What is the haq? What is the right of this sword? So Rasulullah wasallam said, The right of this sword is... You take it, you fight it until it is bent. And then he says, uh, Give it to me. I will take care of this sword and I will fight it. I'll give the right. I will give the haq for this sword. Now, subhanAllah, it is said, uh, Abu Dujana, he's famous for the red turban. 
Now he takes out this red cloth and he ties it on his head. And then he holds the sword up and he walks boastfully and he's boasting as we're walking within the ranks and the kuffar are looking at him. And it is said when he wore that, it was like the turban of death because it's the color of the blood, it's red. And also he was a fierce warrior as well from the Jahiliyyah as well in the Ansaris. He was known, he was known like a fighter, Abu Dujana. And uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, this is the walk that Allah and his messenger do not like. But in the battlefield, you have to boast and you have to show your courage to the kuffar. And so that's what he was doing. So I remember I told you last week uh, as well, in the battlefield, you don't go uh, and, and tell uh, the other person, are you ready to fight or not? You don't go like that. You just go and you show your valor, your, your courage. And that's why you have to be courageous. And subhanAllah, you have to do the first attack. You have to go all out in the battlefield. And subhanAllah, at this time also understand the kuffar, have, they have come uh, forward with uh, 3,000 soldiers. So the kuffar uh, have come forward with 3,000 soldiers. So this is a big number. And also they've actually brought uh, the entire women as well. So the women have come as well. Why? Because Abu Sufyan has a plan. He's come for the kill. So the women are there, so the men will fight in front of their wives. You know how we boast to our wives that I did this to my boss and I did it to my, I said that to my boss and this and that. And you say nothing to your boss. I mean, your wife's not there. She's not watching you. So this time the women are there. So you can't really boast. You know, you have to be there. You have to show your courage. Also, now, th that was the objective. Now, also in the battle, there's always a Mubaraza. Now, the Mubaraza will happen between Bani Abdiddar. Bani Abdiddar in Quraysh, there are different people. Okay, Banu Hashim are the main tribe. Banu Makhzum are the ones who fight. They've got the warriors. Banu Abdiddar, their job is to carry the flag. And so that's their job. Now, subhanAllah, if you remember the Battle of Badr, if you don't remember, you can always subscribe, okay? So, if you remember the Battle of Badr, Banu Abdiddar, when their first man was slayed, they ran away. That's when they were on the run. And so now, they, uh, Abu Sufyan says to Banu Abdiddar, he's saying, he's praying with their psychology. He's saying, if you cannot take this job, then other people are there who want to raise the banner. Banu Abdiddar, they boast, they're like, even if our last man dies, we are going to hold on to this the flag, the banner. We're not going to drop it. Now this is the time when Talha ibn Abi Talha, this is a really fierce warrior from Bani Abdiddar. He comes out and he challenges. Mubaraza in Arabic, I've already told you, that's the duel. So you challenge someone and you actually tell him to come and fight. So this is the battle. So if you uh, watch these arm, uh, the movies of the past, you know, the, 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 the tough guy, he calls upon the duel. He says, come and fight. So this is how the battles were. So even now, the battles were like that. So Mubarak said, Talha ibn Abi Talha, he's the man from Bani Abdiddar, he challenges. He challenges who wants his mother uh, to uh, lose the child and who wants his wife to become a widow, then come and fight. Or the children to become yatim. To come and fight. So now Ali radiallahu an he asks permission from Rasulullah and he goes. Now Talha is not like wearing any uh, uh, minimal armor. He is covered from his head all the way till his uh, knees. That's how uh, covered his armor is. So when the battle starts, and Talha ibn Abi Talha is not a Joe Blow, he is known as a fighter of the Quraysh. And when he comes, he's a big guy as well. Ali radiallahu an comes forward and he hits him hard. While he hits him hard, the, the sword cannot penetrate. Why? Because the, the, the armor is so strong that the sword actually stops there. He tries to hit him again from the side, but it doesn't hit his hands as well because the armor is strong. Now Ali realizes there's no way he can actually uh, go through uh, this armor. He has to attack him at the bottom where the, uh, where the legs are. And now when he comes to attack, he attacks on his leg and he chops his leg off. 
And when he chops his leg off, now Talha falls on the ground and his aura is uncovered. And he says to Ali radiallahu an, you are my kinship, you are from my, my family. Leave me for the sake of my family. Do not kill me. And subhanAllah, Ali radiallahu an, this is in the battle, in the middle of the battle. He does not kill him, he leaves him. And when he comes back, because then see, when you go for the duel, when you win, you actually take the armor out, you take the sword away. And they say, why didn't you take him down? He said, he, he t gave me the pledge, the qasam, from the, my family. And I did not want it to kill him. So I left him alone. Now, this is the first man that dies. Now, Hamza also takes an advantage. The second person who's holding uh, the, the flag, he goes and he kills him. The third person who's holding the flag, now he holds the flag. He's killed as well. The fourth one is killed as well. The fifth one is now holding the flag. While he's holding the flag, Al Asim ibn Thabit, he comes and he kills the fifth one. So when he kills the fifth member at that time, right at that time, uh, uh, Sulafa binti Abi Talha, who is also the sister of Talha ibn Abi Talha, Sulafa actually comes and she says, uh, out loud now because she thinks Asim is the one who's killed everyone so she says out loud whoever brings me the head of Asim I will drink wine in the head and then I will fill the head up and I will give you gold for that now Asim Ibn Thabit becomes an open target now everyone knows okay if they need that money they have to go after him so this is the one that they have to go after. And now subhanAllah, the fifth man comes, Hamza comes now and he gets in there and he kills him as well. The sixth one as well. And so it's said when the sixth one dies, it's, it's kind of like, you know, one after the other, one after the other, they're dying. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like they, they really don't know what's happening now. So the seventh one comes, it is said the nine people are killed one after the other from the flag and now they just drop the flag they don't want to hold the flag anymore why because they know if they hold the flag that's the one who's going to die because the muslims are really coming after also another person that shined in this battle is sa'ad ibn abi waqas as the only time in arabs they would say fidaka ummi wa abi so may my mother be sacrificed or ransom for you or the father. No one ever, Rasulullah has ever said this word for anyone. He would say to Sa'ad, Irmi ya Sa'ad, throw an arrow ya Sa'ad, Fidaka ummi wa abi. That may my mother be ransom on you Sa'ad and my father. And he would say that to him. And subhanAllah, I'm not going to give you a story now. You become emotional. SubhanAllah, can you imagine these Sahabas? And then Mirza Sahab, he's got the courage to call out these Sahabas that the Prophet actually said. And he fought for these Sahabas. He, he gave his life for these Sahabas. He was there who gave his sleep for these Sahabas. And we have people that they go after. And say, you know, Mirza Sahab is not the first one. And the real man, the real perpetrator who started this in Pakistan was Maulana Maududi. This is the first man who actually came to attack the, the, you, the honor of the Sahaba. And the Mirza Sahab is just a follower. This, uh, SubhanAllah, Pakistani scholars, they are on another level. You know, I uh, encourage you, I don't know if you've ever uh, listened to people like Maulana Manzoor Mengel. Mulana Manzur Mengel is a really fiery uh, scholar and he is like, you know, sometimes he uses like some language which is questionable as well, but he just goes after people who attack the Sahaba. So these are the people, you know, subhanAllah, one of the uh, people at that time uh, was um, Sheikh Ghulam uh, Nabi, I think his full name is, when he heard about uh, Mulana uh, Abu Al-Ala Al-Mawdudi, he became so angry, he said, Kon hai ye mardudi. He actually wrote a book. He wrote a book and he put the title, Kon hai ye mardudi. And that, that's a really famous book, you can actually read it. So he wrote a book and, and subhanAllah, we uh, have to understand, Sahabas are special. You know, me and you we can never reach that. And at least uh, our Sharia has come through these guys. We're talking about people that Rasulullah, they're defending, they're giving their lives. For the sake of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, 
Imagine us in these situations. Now, subhanAllah, let's move to the, this guy, Abu Dujana. Let's see what he's doing. Abu Dujana, Zubair ibn Awam says, I was amazed that Rasulullah gave him the sword and he made this big claim. I wanted to see if this big claim is just a, a false claim or not. So I am going behind Abu Dujana and I'm watching what he's doing. He says, well, whoever comes in front of him, he kills him, like he cuts him off. That's how he's, he's dealing with them as if, uh, you know, we would say today, like someone's get, uh, cutting vegetables. That's how he's dealing with people. And subhanAllah, he is hitting people. He is, uh, they, it says there was a fighter of, that I wanted this uh, Abu Dujana to go. And he was causing a lot of harm to the Muslims. So this fighter was covered in armor, top to bottom as well. It is said that his head was exposed, but his body was all covered. Abu Dujana, and Zubair said, I prayed that Abu Dujana goes to him and he meets him. And subhanAllah, Abu Dujana meets him and he chops his head half from the top with the sword of Muhammad SubhanAllah, I, I tell you uh, brothers, you try to cut the bone through, even, you know, with the cleaver, it's not easy. Can you imagine the courage of these Sahabis? They've got the sword, heads the very, you know, it's a, it's a difficult part, you know, the, to even cut through. And these Sahabis, their courage is on another level. May Allah actually allow us to be courageous as these people as well. Now it's said there was another, so there was another lady who was causing a lot of havoc. So this lady was called, uh, sorry, not lady, I shouldn't have given it out. The seerah says there was a person who was covered in the armor and was ca uh, causing a lot of havoc. So telling, go attack the Muslims, go attack the Muslims, really, uh, you know, inciting them. So at that time, uh, Abu Dujana goes, finds this person and is about to hit the person. The person turns around and screams, well, 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 is like, you, you know, don't, it's kind of like a reaction that the women would make when they would get surprised. So when she says that, uh, Abu Dujana realizes this is a woman, this is not a man. So he say, well, I would not kill anyone with the sword of Rasulullah. Who was this? This was Hind binti Utba. Remember, Hind's come out. She wants to take revenge of what's happened to the father, what's happened to the brother. You know, they were both there and what's happened to the uncle and they were killed by Hamza. So she was there, she knows. And Utba ibn Walid is a big man, he was a big guy from Quraysh. He was a, a VIP of Quraysh. So she's not going to let this go any, any. So she's there as well. And Al-Bara ibn Azib says, now this is where the tables have turned. Now these guys are running for their lives. They don't want to be there anymore. Muslims are penetrating. So if I was to give you an analogy, the women cannot see, but so this is the mountain at the back, and this is the army, this is the camp of Muslims, and this is the Qurayshis, and so they're attacking, and this is the, this is the mountain, the, the uh, Jabal Ruma, okay? So, there's, so Muslims are now attacking from here, from here, and these guys are on the run. So they don't have anywhere to go. And uh, I, I always forget, there's a TV there, inshallah, next week, um, uh, not next week, the week after. Week after my, um, I think it will be my last lecture for September. I'll only do one because I'm going to Umrah with the groups, uh, we're taking the younger people. That's not one of the groups that you want to go because these people only go for shopping and to see the Kaaba. That's it. They only go to have fun over there and to take selfies and put GoPro on their heads while they're doing Tawaf. And so may Allah help these younger ones. So it's a difficult task. You know, you, you take them, it's like you, they don't even wake up for Fajr for Haram as well. That's a demise. So in the morning, you're banging on the doors to, uh, to tell them to come. And this salah is more than thousand times you get the reward. Hundred thousand, sorry. And they miss out on that as well. So make dua for these younger ones. They, year 10 is a very difficult age. If your son, anyone over here, if your children are year 10, that's a difficult age. That's when they start looking at their own muscles and they get bigger than their fathers. So they start eyeballing their fathers as well. So as a difficult age and subhanAllah they know the emergency numbers in Australia. So the father says anything, 
they just call the authority on you. So that, that's the problem. And in Pakistan, mashallah, we have a, 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 a remedy which is called chitr. So that remedy works with uh, all, everyone, mashallah. You all have been through that. Our, our parents uh, gave, medicated us with that, overdosed sometimes. But alhamdulillah, I'd say even if you're overdosed, you still. Uh, there are ramifications, but it's not like it's a, it becomes life threatening, but it only helps you. So, anyways, um, Al Bara ibn Azib, this is from Bukhari, this is a hadith. So, Al Bara ibn Azib says, they turned around and they were running so fast that we could see the ankles of the women because they had lifted their dresses and they were running. So they could see. So imagine even in Jahiliyyah, the women of the day, they would cover themselves. So they, they had lifted their skirts and they were running like that. So they were running for their lives. They were running to close by to the mountain in the corner to hide over there. That's what they were doing. So, uh, and they, they had lifted their skirts and they were running up the mountain. There was on the other side of Uhud. So the Sahabas now became complacent. How did they become complacent? Now they started going after money. You know, subhanAllah, you all read Surah Kahf last night or in the morning. Al-mal wal-banoon, zinatul hayat in dunya. SubhanAllah, we have a disease in our uh, banoon. And SubhanAllah, banoon in, in Arabic, if you go to the root word, banoon in, in, in itself is going towards the sons. Okay, not just, we're not talking about daughters over here. Every person, regardless of what culture you come from, you like to have a son. And SubhanAllah, I tell you what, most of the sons are sitting over here and your parents are waiting for you. This is what the sons do. After the marriage, this son that we, the, the fathers inspire to have, it seems like, you know, the daughters, I feel, I feel like when I look at the daughters, they always keep the families connected. They try to call their parents to check on them, and uh, subhanAllah, I've got two daughters. I look at my daughter. My son, don't, they, they don't even bother if I'm alive or not. At times. But then when I look at my daughters, mashallah, they're always checking on me. Always. And you know, when they do something for their mother, they do it for me. Why? Because they know I'm going to get upset. So they, they're always doing things for me as well. So I, I say, subhanAllah, if you've got a daughter, you're very lucky. And this is what the hadith of Bukhari says. If you've got three daughters, you be with Rasulullah like that. If you married them and you looked after them. So the man asks, same hadith. The man asks, what if I had two Rasulullah? He said, if you had two, you'd be with me like this as well. And mashallah, I've got two. <laughs> I make dua that I'll be with like Rasulullah like that. But this is also, you know, we, we say this and... Uh, May Allah allow all our children to be in the right path. Ameen, Ya Rab. Now moving on, they become complacent. Now subhanAllah, ghanima, the mal, the dunya, you know, they're all running. Now the camp of the Muslims, they're collecting all these war booties. You know, the horses, whatever they've left behind. So they're all in the midst, they're trying to collect that. Now there's people up in the mountain when Abdullah ibn Jubair is. Okay, Abdullah ibn Jubair is made the leader. He's the main guy. Radiallahu and special man, he's made the leader of Sayyid Rasulullah, made him the leader. And he said to him, do not come down. Two things he said, even if we die, you see birds eating our flesh, do not come down. And if you see there's a clear victory, and we are fighting with one, even if the army is uh, you know, gone, don't come down. Until I tell you, I tell you. SubhanAllah, we, today we say, and we complain about our situation, that... Allah is not uh, helping us. When was the last time we listened to Atiullah wa Rasulahu? When was the last time we followed Allah and His Messenger? SubhanAllah, a, a man, and a, I can be very difficult at times. I look like a very easygoing person, but sometimes when I'm not in the right side, in my right mood, I can be very difficult. And SubhanAllah, uh, just a few days, just two days ago, someone uh, thought. People think I, you know, I am uh, some kind of a, a, a placid person. I put a video, I made a mistake. I made a mistake and I said a, a Nawaz Sharif went to Oxford. I made this mistake. So I found out Nawaz Sharif never went to Oxford. It was just a hearsay. 
So I, I made a video very sarcastically. I said I apologize to the Oxford University that I made a mistake. And then someone, someone with a, sent me a message and he said we got independence in 1947 and the slave mindset is dominant in 2024. On another note, good to see Jahalat of bearded Mulvi, Mulvis determining the caliber of human beings still remains strong. Perhaps you can monetize this too and do that in the subcon as they do that in the subcontinent. Five hundred dollars per caliber statement, and if one offers more, just change the caliber. Now I said, you know what? This is my channel. I'm not going to let you go like this. No way. You messed up with the wrong person. So. I put a message. I said, unfortunately, secularism has enslaved the freedom fighters of 1947. I wonder what they will say to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who defined the caliber of people. And ironically, he was a bearded Maulana as well. The hatred towards Islam and Islamic knowledge bearers has been rampant and a so-called freed people who will stand under the flag of a clean shaver thinker but find it hard to follow the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Let me define you the caliber of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, what he said, be different to the polytheist, let your bears grow. And one final advice to me and to the emotional people, there is something in English called sarcasm. Oxford Dictionary, it is a noun, the use of irony to mock or convey contempt. And I will make it easy for you, I will give you a sentence. You didn't like the note of sarcasm in the bearded Molvi's comment. So I left it there. So subhanAllah, I tell you what, I can be very difficult. If you touch me for Islam, then I don't leave anyone. If it's my personal affair, I'm going to let you go. If you challenge me with Islam, Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me knowledge. I gave my life for this. I went overseas to learn Islam. I did not waste my time. I did not say, lock the room up and study Islam in a, in a room in front of the computer. Okay, like what people do today. And so don't come after the sunnah of the Prophet and then these people, may Allah help them, subhanAllah. Um, it's, it's kind of like, you know, they don't understand. We, we, uh, we are suffering in Pakistan. Why? Because we think that following Islam is not the right thing. We're suffering. Whenever you have a leader who talks about Islam, we become, like, we become scared. What is he going to, going to bring? What has the, the, the civilization of the British civilization or the Western civilization given us? Nothing. They've given us nothing. You know, this riba system that we have in our country, that's one of the biggest demise that we have. If you take the riba out from Pakistan, you will have a country. Look at Afghanistan. Look at Afghanistan, right next to you, celebrated the third year of independence. Now, subhanAllah, uh, I want to actually take one of the lessons I w I'm going to uh, focus on. I want to actually focus on Surah Ali Imran, because Ali Imran actually talks about Uhud. So when we finish the entire battle, I want to read some of the ayahs. Some of the ayahs like this, starting from the ayah number 150 onwards, which Allah actually speaks about. Now Allah actually speaks about the people. So these people on the mountain, they're having an argument. And these kuffar are on the run. Now there's one guy who's running and looking backwards as well, because he does not want to lose the battle. And that's Khalid bin Walid. Now I, I want to also tell people, how old is Khalid bin Walid? 20 years old. Plus, 21. Today you send 21 year old with the money to deposit in the bank, you'll be lucky if it's in there. Today you send the 20 year old to do something on his own, he will call you 500 times uh, just to make sure if he's doing the right thing. There's a 20 year old who's given a flag to fight. Fight who? The best man in the history. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So man's courageous. You know Khalid bin Walid? Inshallah, if uh, Allah gives us life, if this uh, seerah finishes, then we can speak about the Sahabas. And Khalid bin Walid is a special man. You know, Allah gave him special qualities. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in ayah number 152, this is the ayah that came down for the archers on the mountain, and this is the entire thing happening. وَلَقَدْ صَدَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ وَعْدَهُ إِذْ تَحَشُّونَهُمْ بِإِذْنِ حَتَّى إِذَا فَشِلْتُمْ وَتَنَعْزَعْتُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ عَسَيْتُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ 
ما أراكم ما تحبون منكم من يريد الدنيا ومنكم من يريد الآخرة ثم صرفكم عنهم لا يبتليكم ولقد أف عنكم والله ذو فضل المؤمنين Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now telling these people that Allah fulfilled his promise. That Allah sent you the help. That's the first one. He's saying, وَلَقَدْ صَدَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ وَعْدَهُ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he actually fulfilled his promise. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ تَحُسُّونَهُمْ بِإِذْنِ That once you started arguing amongst yourselves, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, حَتَّ إِذَا فَشِلْتُمْ and Allah actually humiliated you. Because you now are arguing. That when you were arguing, you disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Araakum ma tuhibbun. Then Allah knew what you wanted. You are going after this mal ghanima. That's what's something that's beloved to you. Minkum may yuridu dunya. From you are the people who wanted dunya. And also Allah says, Wa minkum may yuridu al-akhirah. And also there are people that actually wanted Akhirah as well. ثُمَّ صَرَفَكُمْ عَنْهُمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you left your messenger behind. You made him angry. Because he's the one who told you not to come down. Because you were only worried about the losses. You're worried about the losses, that you're not going to get that. وَلَقَدْ أَعْفَ عَنْكُمْ But remember, see, Allah has Afa. Allah, you know, He, he loves. He loves the Muslimin. Wallahu dhul fadl ala al-mu'mineen. The fadl of Allah is over the mu'mineen. Even if you fought, remember that Allah is not going to be humiliating you, you know? So Allah is, He did it for this time. What you did, Allah wanted to show you the results. So after that, what happens is, uh, Khalid Walid, amazing. A general is watching. 40 archers come down. How many were on the mountain? That's a test. Quickly. 50. So, 40 come down, 10 are left. Now, Khalid bin Walid, he now turns around and he goes from the back. So this is uh, the Jabal Ru'ma and uh, this is the camp of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa This is the Uhud. So he comes from behind the, and he climbs the mountain. He comes on the top now and he takes down everyone. The 10 and he has 100 to 150 men with him. And so he's now going on the offensive. And subhanAllah, as soon as this is happening, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shows the courage now. Rasulullah knows if he screams, Quraysh will know where he is. And he's in the back. And this is where the Muslims are, uh, are the first group, because they're divided now. There's a gap in the middle. So Khalid bin Walid is coming down the mountain. He's in the middle now. He's going to attack the Muslims from the back and from the front as well. Because he's got soldiers now. So he knows if I scream, then Khalid bin Walid or the Quraysh army, the Kuffar will know where I am. Either I can be quiet and let them figure out or either I can scream. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam screams. And subhanAllah, he screams out loud and he says to the Muslims to turn around. And when he says, Khalid bin Walid exactly knows where Rasulullah is. And he now penetrates toward Muhammad sallallahu and also now fighting this army on the other side. Now what happened was, when this happened, at the front are the warriors, Mus'ab ibn Umair, Ali radiallahu an, Miqdad, Abu Dujana, all these guys are at the front. And Hamza, because they're fighting, because you know they were killing all these people. And there's other people with them as well. Also with them is another person who, who is Hudayfa uh, 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 ibn Yaman's father, who's at the front as well. Hudayfa ibn Yaman, very quickly, Al Yaman, his real name is not Al Yaman. Who can tell me quickly what his real name is? If anyone knows. Hudayfa ibn Yaman's real name is Hussein. Hussein with the Ha, Hussein. Okay, Hussein is a uh, from he's an from an Arab. He came from uh, Banu Abbas. Banu Abbas was actually not Quraysh, but the Arabs that lived in that vicinity. So he murdered someone, and they abandoned him, and he came to the Ansari. He married over here, and he lived in Medina. And so they would call him Yamani, because the people of Ye Medina were Yamani because they came down from the south, Yemen. So that's why they were known as Yamani. 
So he, his name became Ali Yaman. Ali Yaman. That's what people. He even asked Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Am I an Ansari or a Muhajir?" Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "You both." Your Ansari and your Muhajir as well. And his son becomes special after this event. Who is his son? Now, this is a test for you. Hudayfa ibn Yaman. What's his title? Sahib as Sir. The man who is a secret keeper. He knows the names of the Munafiqun who attack Rasulullah between the mountains when they were coming from Tabuk. That's why he was known as Sahib as Sir. Rasulullah called Hudayfa and he told him, he screamed, Hudayfa was the one who actually came. And then he said, go and see who they were. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, it was dark, didn't see anyone. He says, I will tell you the names of everyone, who they were. And the hadith says there were 10. And subhanAllah, can you imagine this? Umar ibn Khattab would always say, Ya Rasul to Hudayfa, was my name there? Was my name there? Hudayfa would get angry. And he said, Umar, your name is not there. You're from Asharatu Mubasharun. And then uh, Umar ibn Khattab would always follow Hudayfa when he was a Khalifa, and he would not lead uh, the Salatul Janazah for anyone if Hudayfa was not there. He would excuse. So if he would see Hudayfa is not in the Janazah, he would excuse himself and leave. Because he knew that Hudayfa knows these people and he's not going to pray Janazah for the Munafiq. I would excuse himself and he would leave from there. So this is Hudayfa ibn Yaman. And also understand, both father and son did not get the permission in the first uh, battle of Badr. You know the story very quickly. They came to fight, but they were caught by Quraysh in the middle and Quraysh took a pledge from them. So when they came to Badr, Rasulullah said, because you pledged, a man is a word who keeps his word, you both go back to Medina and Allah will give you the reward. So they never got a chance to fight. Now, subhanAllah, all this is happening. Why did I tell you the story? Now the Muslim are in a skirmish. So they don't know what's happening. You know when the friendly fire happens in the war as well? So you kill your own people. So there is the Muslims, they kill Husayl, thinking that he's one of the Kuffar because they're turning back and they kill him. And Hudayfa sees from the distance, he says, Abikum, Abikum, that's my father. That's my father, he's screaming, but then they kill him. So when he dies, Allah actually says, uh, the, the Rasulullah afterwards, he tells them, this is after the battle where I'll say this now, or else I'll forget. So he says to give 100 camels, the blood money, the dia, and you probably know the blood money is very big at the moment in Pakistan because of the lady that killed, that's another topic as well uh, to talk about. But the blood money, if someone is killed, uh, not premeditated okay it's not premeditated so meaning premeditated is you went and you wanted to kill someone but if it's a manslaughter and if it was something that you did not want to unintentional killing and in that there is deer deer is the word in Arabic for blood money so that's hundred camels how many hundred camels so even if you know in, in uh, so anyone that's lived in Saudi if uh, a Arab or someone died they killed someone in an accident these labors, they would give them some hundred thousand rial or something, which is like the equal of hundred camels. So they, they, there's a price money. I mean, what is the poor family going to do with the hundred camels? They're going to do nothing. So now it's a financial amount they, they get. So that's what uh, Raymond Davis, he also, subhanAllah, even we have twisted Islam so much that we put blood money for the kuffar as well. There's no blood money for the kuffar. If the kuffar's actually taken life, you test him with the hudud, there's a had for him. And this guy did not kill someone unintentionally. As to see how much warped we get. Anyways, uh, I'm not going to go into Ali, because uh, Hamza. Hamza's a really big one because I want to go on some tangents. Actually, you know what? I'll go into Hamza because then it will be. So basically, very quickly, Hudayfa ibn Yaman, he gives uh, these hundred camels in charity. No. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa becomes so happy that he gives the entire hundred camels in charity. And he says, why? لا تثريب عليكم اليوم There's no retribution. That these people, they did it uh, out uh, unintentionally and I'm not going to hold this accountable. So this is what he does. And so now, also, uh, quick rundown, Wahshi is a man now, he sees uh, from far away, 
And Washi, think of Washi as Arshad Nadim, okay? So it's like a javelin thrower. So you guys know Arshad Nadim. So he's the only gold medal that Pakistan's ever won. So think of Washi as Arshad Nadim, okay? So he, he can get the target. So he's even better than Arshad Nadim. If you had Washi today, it probably would have broken the Olympic record. So, so he sees uh, Hamza from a distance. Now also understand who has given the ransom of uh, Hamza to... Uh, now let's test your, uh, your knowledge. Who has given the ransom of uh, Hamza's life to... Uh, I was about to say Arshad Nadim, to Washi. <laughs> See, I knew that. You're going to make the mistake. It's not him. Whose slave is Washi? Jubair ibn Mut'im. And who's Jubair ibn Mut'im? Jubair ibn Mut'im is Mut'im ibn Adi's son. What did Rasulullah say about Mut'im ibn Adi? He said he looked at all the slaves on the day of Badr, the prisoners of war. And he said, if Mutim ibn Adi was here, I freed everyone for Mutim. Mutim was the second best man in Quraysh who loved Rasulullah but never converted to Islam. That was Mutim. In the Battle of Badr, what did Rasulullah say? You see Mutim, don't fight him. Go away from him. And Mutim ibn, uh, ibn Adi was the man who actually took Rasulullah back after Taif. He had no. Kafala, no, uh, so Muta ibn Adi, so even see, uh, they say Wali ke ghar shaitan, this is like Muta son is Jubair. Now subhanAllah, now Jubair also becomes a Muslim, Allah guides him, not now. And Jubair also is caught in the first battle as well. Jubair is a prisoner of slave in the first battle as well. He's actually caught in Badr. He's tied up in the masjid as well. But why do you think he wants to take revenge? So Ayma ibn Adi is his uncle who's killed by Hamza. So he wants to take the revenge, uncle for an uncle. As the uncle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I want to actually take revenge. So that's his revenge. He says to Wahshi, if you actually kill um, uh, Hamza, I give you your freedom. I don't want anything, you just kill him. Wahshi says, I didn't even knew uh, or, or my any well, who this Hamza was or anything I didn't know about anything I just wanted my freedom that was in my mind I did not even fight on that day I was watching from behind that this is the man I need to take for my freedom I had no desire to kill him and this is a long hadith you can actually read it this is a hadith which is mentioned by Washi himself when he's blinded. Okay, he's become, he can't see that much. He's not blind, but he can't see that much. Two ta uh, tabi'een, they come and they come to see uh, Washi. And when they come to see Washi, Washi is saying the story. And Washi looks at one's uh, feet and he looks at the feet and he says, Oh, you are so and so. Now, you n need to know this, the Arabs were masters when they looked at someone's feet. They will tell you, uh, you know, your background, your entire background. And this is why, you know, Zayd um, ibn Harsa and Osama ibn Zayd, they used to say he's not the father of Osama. Who's Osama's mother? Baraka. Who's Baraka? Baraka is the one that touched Muhammad wasallam the first time he came to the dunya. She was a wet nurse and she was also the slave woman. And Osama was married to her after Zainab bin Tijahash. And she was Ethiopian. So it is said they called the Arab man because they knew about genealogy. They called this Arab man and he only looked at the feet and he said, this feet belongs to this feet. The sun is dark. And this is a hadith as well. This feet belongs to this feet. So saying this is father and son. And you know, in our culture as well, they say, Bala Per Gavarka. Or maybe they've also stayed with the Arabs and they know, Alhamdulillah, I don't have big feet. Okay, only kidding. <laughs> but they, it's, it's a thing, you know. I only, when, I, when you start reading the seerah, you start learning about these things. And uh, this is something that we found, found out, inshallah. So very quickly, uh, Washi is telling the story. He tells the entire story. Now, after that, uh, uh, Jubair, he says when he, he throws the spear, now this javelin, 
a javelin, you can understand javelin, mashallah, Pakistanis are over the moon because of javelin throw. So he throws the javelin and it comes, goes from the back and it comes out from the front. And it says, Hamza turns around the lion of Allah and he looks at me and he charges at me. Can you imagine the spears out and he's coming, the blood's gushing out and he comes close and he drops on the ground. Because there's too much loss of blood, subhanAllah. Hamza dies, Allahu Akbar. Can you imagine that? It is said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got so angry when Hamza died. When he saw his thing, inshallah, I'm, I'm going to talk about this uh, next week because it's slightly long, but I'll, I'll finish off over here, then we'll keep it because we'll keep it for one, one or two questions. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, imagine this, brothers, like subhanAllah, someone that Rasulullah loved. You know, it is the, the, the honor and the pride of the Arabs. This is the man, Haniya. You know, the word Haniya means the pride. It's the word or the Haniya of the Arabs that this man converted to Islam. Why? Because his nephew was insulted. He did not come to Islam because his heart was ready. Can you imagine this? Out of Haniya, that no, my family is insulted. I'm not going to leave him. He went and he said to the entire Quraysh, I'm a Muslim. Now you touch my nephew. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and Hamza are actually, you know when they say, they are uh, foster brothers. Do you know that? They will say, Dud Sharik. They're foster brothers. Thubiya, which is Abu Jahl's, uh, not Abu Jahl, sorry, uh, the uncle, Abu Lahab. So Abu Lahab's uh, slave uh, woman actually wet nursed Hamza as well. And she also wet nurse Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Between them is only two and a half years. Two and a half years. So one's the uncle, he's two and a half years older. So they grew up as friends as well. So they knew, can you imagine his, his remorse when he saw his own uncle lying over there? The man, you know, Hamza, Asadullahi wa Rasulihi. I don't know if you've been to the Pakistani masjid. This is the second part of the khutbah. You know, they say, wa aqdahum ali. And then they come to that. وَسَيِّدَتِ نِسَاءِ أَهْلَ الْجَنَّةِ And then they come. وَالْحَسَنْ وَالْحُسَيْنِ سَيِّدَ شَبَابِ أَهْلَ الْجَنَّةِ And then they come to the last part. وَحَمْزَةُ أَصَدُ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ They all, oh, you know, this is something in the second khutbah. If you go to a Pakistani masjid, that's the second khutbah. That's always the thing. You know, subhanAllah. And he passes away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise me and you with uh, Hamza. And inshallah, I want to tell you uh, some other stories uh, regarding this about Jubair as well. How Jubair converted to Islam. And also about Wahshi as well. How Wahshi took the best man and how he took the lowest man as well. Musaylima also was killed by Wahshi. Musaylima ibn Kazar. SubhanAllah, he made his own surah. Al filu mal fil wa ma adraka mal fil. He said, I've got better Quran than Rasulullah. And the Arabs would laugh. Arabs would say, our liar, this is their words, our liar is better than the truthful of the Arabs. This is what they would say. They're saying that one is truthful, but our liar is better. Anyways, inshallah, we'll open it for questions. And uh, after that, there's biryani. Only kidding, guys. And there's, there's people who listen overseas as well. They must think they eat biryani all the time. It's Pakistanis, they can't live without biryani. Uh, so, inshallah, we'll open it for questions. Any questions you have, uh, I'll take questions about anything. And if you don't, um, you know, uh, we, can, we can move on, inshallah. Mirza Sahab, yeah. They, they, they call him, nowadays he's got a new name, Chote, Chote Mirza Sahab. Bade Mirza Sahab is Ghulam Ahmed, yeah. and Chote Mirza Sahab is my engineer. So they call him Chote Mirza Sahab. You know, subhanAllah, Mirza Sahab has exposed himself. You look, um, yes, there are flaws in uh, the, the, the Pakistani ulama as well. Uh, he is, is on the de defensive for the Qadianis. Every time there's something happens, he says, oh, the Deobans have uh, their skeletons, or this one has their skeletons. The Deobans have their skeletons, or the Barelwis have their skeletons, but they do not take Nabuwa away from Muhammad sallallahu They can have their skeletons. They never said that Muhammad sallallahu was not the last Nabi. The problem is with the, the uh, Bare Mirza Sahab. He had a problem. He was the last Nabi. 
Allahu Akbar. It was a he actually, I gave a lecture over here. I, I am amazed, subhanAllah. They said uh, one quick thing, inshallah. You know, the dream. Dream's amazing. Someone just came to me just recently, uh, just in the school. And, um, and this is a good, nice child, mashallah. He said, the Shaykh, I saw um, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I got excited and uh, subhanAllah, you know, whenever someone comes to me, I'm a Salafi, you know, I need to qualify everything. I don't believe like if you see in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I said, MashaAllah, you know, Allah has given you uh, like this uh, azima. I've actually seen Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I said, can you describe him to me? Because you know, the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith, if you saw me, you saw me. Because shaitan cannot take my, uh, you know, he cannot come in my vision. But now, how do we know? Because Sahaba knew Rasulullah. So when Sahabas are asking the question, they know how Rasulullah looked like. You know, they know how he looks like. We don't even know the hadith of Umm Ma'bad. How many of you know the hadith of Umm Ma'bad? Okay, how many of you know that? If you don't know that, then you've been watching someone else in your dreams. I tell you this. So now this guy came to me. As a nice kid, I'm not taking anything away from him. So he says, Shaykh, I'm saying, okay, descri describe me. And he said, you know, um, the Shaykh, he was wearing a suit. You know, he was wearing a suit, and Allah, mashallah, okay. Shaykh, he was glowing, and no beard, clean shaven. And I said, mashallah, so, and then I said to him, you know what, you, should, you saw the shaitan. And this was not just any shaitan, this was a British uh, shaitan that you saw. It's another one with the suit, and no beard as well. This, I said, this is not just any shaitan, this is a British shay shaitan that you should saw. And now, I mean it, why? Because Rasulullah sallallahu has a long beard. Umm Ma'bad says, the hair was long and it was flowing down below the earlobes, okay? And the face is glowing and the beard is like the lion because it covers, you know, it covers the entire chest and he has seven hair, white hair in his beard. If you saw a man in a suit, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not the man in the suit. He hasn't got clean shave. He's a man who, I've reread the hadith now. It says, grow your beard. That's a, that's a British say, shaitan that you guys have seen. So on that uh, dream, Mirza Sahib's dreams, mashallah, dreams. He's seeing angels, angels suited, booted. They asked him the name of the angel, Tichi Tichi. As one angel, mashallah, as Mirza Sahab, shaitan seeing shaitan. And they asked him the other angel, he said, this angel had a lot of money, mashallah. You know, uh, this is, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Sheikh Mumtaz, he is uh, funny. Sheikh Mumtaz says, uh, So he's actually talking about Mirza Sahab. He says, Mirza Sahab saw an angel, and this is in his book, Kitab al -Bariya. Okay, no, we're not making this up. In Kitab al -Bariya, the Mirza Saab sees this angel and he says this angel was suited booted and, he, and you know he was giving him a lot of money so Billy good teacher you know that's why he was giving that thing so he said he's giving a lot of money he asked him you're looking after me mashallah who are you what's your name and they said the guy said my name is Mutandas and subhanallah even the angels are not Muslim Mirza, Mirza Saab has angels who have these funny names so you can imagine shaitan is, can only see shaitan there's no way these shaitans can see Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I'm not taking anyone's dream away. If you see I, your homework, Umm Ma'bad hadith. Inshallah, next class we start with Umm Ma'bad hadith. I actually will read it in Arabic and I will explain the hadith to you. And then we'll go to the battle of Uhud. We stop over there. If anyone's got a question, they can ask me. We've all gone over time. But inshallah, um, if you don't have a question, we finish off inshallah. And I think there's, uh, on that point, not to take anything away from that. The word is Ra'ani. So if you hear a voice, that's not Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the issue now. Because the hadith is very explicit. He says, whoever sees. He did not say whoever listens. So this is the, the ulama can debate on that. But I'm not disagreeing with you. But I'm saying I, I'm a literalist. So I will go by what Umm Ma'bad said. But all due respect, you know, our scholars have their own thing. This is my opinion on this. But Jazakallah Khair for enlightening me on that as well. 
اللهم احدنا في من حديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا في معاطيت وقنا وصرف عنا شر ما قديت فإنك تقضي بالحق ولا يقضى عليك فإنه لا يذل من ولعيت ولا يعز من عاديت تباركت ربنا وتعاليت لا ملجع ولا منج منك إلا إليك لك الحمد على ما قديت نستغفرك من جميع الذنوب وخطايا ونتوب إليك ربنا حب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما يا رب العالمين يا الله يا الله we ask you يا الله يا الله that the brother that sits over here يا الله that you gave him a beautiful son يا الله you gave him an induction in their family يا الله as learn we ask you يا الله to make him the coolness of his father and his mother's eyes يا الله يا الله we ask you يا الله to raise him on the banner on the message of Islam يا الله and make him from the people that take this religion forward يا الله and يا الله we ask you all these young children that sit over here يا الله to also make them the coolness of their eyes of their parents يا الله and and allow them, Ya Allah, to take this banner of this religion forward, Ya Allah. And we ask, Ya Allah, to protect these children, Ya Allah, and to protect all our children, Ya Allah, from the difficulties, Ya Allah, of dunya, Ya Allah, from the shar of shaitan, Ya Allah. And Ya Allah, to keep them guided, Ya Allah. When we are not around, Ya Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, that they're the ones who take this Islam forward and they pass it down, Ya Allah. And Ya Allah, this brother, Ya Allah, he gave us, Ya Allah, he came and he shared his happiness with us, Ya Allah. Allah, and he, Ya Allah, he provided, Ya Allah, give barakah in his risk, Ya Allah, give barakah in his food, Ya Allah, give barakah in his life, Ya Allah, and give barakah in his family, Ya Allah, and Ya Allah, make, give barakah to everyone that sits over here, Ya Allah, and we ask, Ya Allah, when our wounds, Ya Allah, when we are happy, Ya Allah, but we also have the wounds, Ya Allah, of the people of Gaza, Ya Allah, and the people of Sudan, Ya Allah, the people of Kashmir, the people of Uhur, Ya Allah, everywhere around the world, Ya Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, to bring Bring ease, Ya Allah, to their lives as well, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, to accept from us, Ya Allah, whatever we said, Ya Allah, and that was beneficial, Ya Allah, then that was from you, Ya Allah. And whatever we said, Ya Allah, and that had no benefit, Ya Allah, and if it was only made up, Ya Allah, that is from us, Ya Allah, we're weak people, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, forgive our sins, Ya Allah. أقول قولي هذا سفر الله لي ولكم فسفر الله إنه الغفور الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد. وعلى عاله وصحبه أجمعين ورحمة الله